Well, good evening and welcome. My name is So Young Lee. I'm the uh, Landon and Lavinia Clay Chief Curator here at the Harvard Art Museums, and it is a great pleasure to welcome you to this very special event. And as we begin tonight's program, we'd like to acknowledge that Harvard University is located on the traditional and ancestral land of the Massachusetts, the original inhabitants of what is now known as Boston and Cambridge. We pay respect to the people of the Massachusetts tribe, past and present, and honor the land itself, which remains sacred to the Massachusetts people. And today, we are absolutely delighted to host Dr. Rosario I. Granados, Marilyn Toma, Associate Curator, Art of the Spanish Americas at the Blanton Museum of Art in Austin, Texas. And she will deliver her lecture titled, Artifice and Invention, Displaying Art of the Spanish Americas. Dr. Granados' keynote tonight kicks off two days of intimate conversations among Harvard students, art museum staff, and nationally renowned scholars around materiality, race, and museum practice in relation to the art and visual cultures of the Spanish colonial period in the Americas. These conversations accompany our very special exhibition currently on view titled From the Andes to the Caribbean, American Art from the Spanish Empire, which weaves together 26 paintings from the Carl and Marilyn Toma Foundation with works from uh, the, the Harvard Art Museums and from uh, partners across campus. The exhibition was organized for the art museums by Horace Ballard, where are you? There you are. The Theodore E. Stebbins Jr. Associate Curator of American Art here at the Harvard Art Museums. And I should say that we had just taken, agreed to take this exhibition prior to Horace arriving. And with just, I don't know, over a year, he had to pull it all together. And as you will see, if you haven't already, been upstairs to the third floor. It is a magnificent show um, in collaboration with so many colleagues here at the museums. The design itself, I think you'll agree, is also just spectacular. The exhibition will stay on view, again, on our third floor um, through July 30th, and it's worth, of course, repeat visits. And I would also like to thank um, Carl and Marilyn Toma Foundation for not only the loans and the exhibition's coordination, but for their enthusiasm for this project. And may I take this moment to thank Natalia Angeres Vieira, who was the Diane and Michael Maher Curatorial Fellow here at the Art Museums and currently the Associate Curator of American Art at Worcester Art Museums for your contribution um, during the early conversations around this exhibition. Support for the exhibition is provided by the Henry Luce Foundation Fund for the American Art Department, the Bolton Fund for American Art, Gift of the Pain Fund, the Alexander S. Robert L. and Bruce A. Beale Found Exhibition Fund, and the Gurel Student Exhibition Fund. And related programming, such as this lecture tonight, is supported by the M. Victor Leventritt um, Lecture Series Endowment Fund, which was established through the generosity of the wife, children, and friends of the late M. Victor Leventritt, Harvard class of 1935. And the purpose of the fund is to present outstanding scholars of the history and theory of art to the Harvard and greater Boston community and what fitting uh, lecturer we have this evening. And without further ado, it's now my great pleasure to introduce uh, or bring to the podium Horace Ballard, who will then introduce our distinguished speaker. Thank you for spending your evening with us tonight. Horace. Good evening. Thank you, So Young and hello to you all. If I might offer one more note of housekeeping before I introduce our distinguished guest, at the end of Dr. Granados' 
um, lecture this evening, my wonderful colleague Erica Lauten and I will take various stairs on either side of uh, the auditorium with microphones in hand. And should you have a question to continue the conversation with Dr. Granados, please just raise your hand. We will come to you. And at about 7.30, I will signal time for the last question. And I will also culminate the evening with our incredible gratitude. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Granados, an incredible scholar in the field and someone who is becoming a dear friend. Dr. Rosario Granados Salinas is the Marilyn Toma Associate Curator of the Art of the Spanish Americas at the Blanton Museum of Art of the University of Texas at Austin. Dr. Granados holds a bachelor's degree from Universidad Iberoamericana a master's in Netherlandish art from the Courtauld, and a PhD in the history of art and architecture from Harvard. Writing about her work as a curator, Dr. Granado states that she views herself as a bridge that connects ideas and peoples through objects. In the care and selection of artifacts to be put in dialogue with one another, those objects, just like the dual hands that made them, begin to engage each other and begin to relate with various constituencies that do not share their original backgrounds. In this sense, conversations happen, not only in the gallery space, but across time. And as we know, it is in the formation of language, in the conversation act of dialogue that justice is found. Before joining the Blanton team in 2016, Dr. Granados held many positions, including a postdoctoral fellow at Skidmore College and head of the research department at the Museo de la Basilica de la Guadalupe in Mexico City. Working across the field of the art and visual culture of the Spanish Americas for nearly 20 years, Dr. Granados has contributed to and organized numerous exhibitions and publications to great acclaim, opening up windows of dialogue and meaning. For example, her 2019 show, Mapping Memory, Space and History in 16th Century Mexico, came exactly 500 years after Hernando Cortez and his company began their march inland and featured maps made by indigenous artists detailing the visual strategies and relational ties between communities that kept their cultural heritage and knowledge alive during conquest. Most recently, Dr. Granados organized last year's incredible painted cloth Fashion and Ritual in Colonial Latin America, a groundbreaking and visually rich survey, amplifying the histories of production, visual representation, and the social and religious functions of textiles in the viceregal era. I had the great honor of visiting with Dr. Granados for the first few days of this calendar year, and she spent hours with me in the Painted Cloth exhibition and in the galleries at the Blanton sharing interest in common and her wisdom. Her generosity and friendship has meant so much. I am delighted that this forum comes at a moment when she can reflect in real time with us on the lessons she takes away from the show, what themes continue to resonate, and perhaps where her interests will lead her next. And all of this comes as we are thinking more hemispherically about the interconnected networks of commerce, colonialism, and belief that engage the collections here at the Harvard Art Museums. Please join me in not just welcoming Dr. Granados home to Harvard, but here to this podium this evening. Rosario. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you, Horace, for that amazing um, introduction and mainly for bringing me here back to Harvard. As you said, it feels like a homecoming. Um, it has been, I think, almost 10 years since I was last in Cambridge. Um, oh, why? Wow. 
I wrote my BA paper on that biombo that you say, uh, which is like kind of a, my introduction to fashion studies when I was literally a baby art, art historian. Um, and long has happened uh, since then. But anyway, so thank you again. Uh, so I was saying to Horace for bringing me here. Um, I, Harvard really, really changed my life. I don't really have to say much about that, as you can imagine. Um, not only did I obtain my doctoral degree uh, here, learning from the very best, but it was here in the ground floor of the Sackler Museum uh, outside Tom Cummins' uh, classroom that I met my husband. Uh, and my son was born in the bird center just uh, down the street. Uh, last time I was here, I had a baby in my belly. She's now almost 11 years old. And it's incredible to think in, in all the things that have happened till, to, uh, since then. Needless to say, I'm profoundly obliged to Horace, as I was saying, for the invitation to deliver this talk, but also to gather with colleagues and friends, old and new, and talk tomorrow uh, and today uh, in a series of workshops about the art of the Spanish Americas and its current trends, both in the academic and museum settings. I'm also thankful to Erica Lawton for taking care of all the details that allow me to be here to, to, tonight. And I'm going to start. I'm going to leave this here. A few weeks ago, the New York Times and NPR, among other outlets, uh, news outlets, informed this. The Vatican repudiated the doctrine of discovery used as justification for colonization. This decision, the result of a series of demands voiced during Pope uh, Francis to Canada, repudiates uh, this bull that you see on the other side of your, of your screen. Um, Signed in 1493 by Alexander VI, uh, Inter Catera, which stated that any land not inhabited by Christians was available to be discovered, claimed and exploited by Christian rulers, and declared that Catholic faith and the, the Christian religion be exalted and be everywhere increased and spread. Although this particular decision is not surprising, no, because uh, since 2015, uh, Pope Francis, in his trip to Bolivia, started to uh, apologize for uh, to native uh, communities. Um, it is indeed uh, a, an interesting context for our conversations regarding the museum display of the art of the Spanish Americas, where um, because especially some people, rightly so, are eager to acknowledge the trauma inflicted in the indigenous peoples. As Gaynor Cavana says, museums are a form of negotiated reality, and thus are incredible platforms to question the past, but also the present. Our historian Charlene Villaseñor, and maybe if I use my glasses, it would be easier to read. Our historian Charlene Villaseñor Black posed pertinent questions along those lines in an article published in 2021. How does one ethically teach art created in the service or forced religious conversion and colonization? What are our ethical obligations as we study art and material culture that results from imposed European cultural, artistic, and linguistic norms? Does studying colonial art imply approval of colonial rule or sanctioning or the catastrophic events of the 16th through 18th centuries in the Americas? My goal tonight is to analyze how those questions and others have been tackled in the last 20 years exhibitions, mainly in the US, but also in France, in Spain, and recently in the UK. I also want to go a bit deeper and question not only the narratives of the social complexities of colonial Latin America have been told, but the different emphasis made by each of those exhibitions we will be discussing tonight. I want you to notice and identify trends during the examples I will be considering, reason why I'm going to ask you to keep in mind three main concepts, visibility, quality, appreciation, as long, uh, along with those two of, my, of the title of this talk, artifice and invention. More than clear answers, I'm eager to share with you different questions I have about those projects, not only as a curator, but also as a mu museum goer. 
I will also be sharing some images of my recent exhibition that Horace mentioned, Painted Cloth, to share my criteria for the display and the ways those concepts of visibility, quality, appreciation, artifice and invention came to be experienced in that particular project. There have been numerous uh, touring exhibitions in the US and colonial art since the uh, 2010s. I'm thinking particularly of those of private collections like the Huber uh, and the Cisneros collections, which uh, I'm proud to say are now a house at the Blanton Museum of Art and also part of the Toma ex uh, collection. No, and they went to many places in Florida. They, they went to Worcester, um, to the Crystal Museum in Virginia, the Crocker Art Museum in California, El Paso Museum of Art, the San Antonio Museum of Art, where now um, uh, we have uh, Lucia. Um, and all this happened, no, uh, um, but those exhibitions and those created around uh, the Carl and Marilyn Thoma collection have been crucial in giving more visibility to the art of the Spanish Americas in the last two decades across the United States. Visibility is crucial because as Luis Elena Alcalá mentioned in a webinar organized by the Blanton uh, almost a year ago, giving visibility to the art of the Spanish Americas outside academia is paramount to recognizing its value and further inciting, and, and further inciting appreciation. But I think it was evident to you that the, the, the museums that I mentioned are not first tier museums. So it's mandatory to also consider those exhibitions organized in major art museums that you know, have also been traveling uh, across the country. I'm showing you here four that without any doubt had profound impact, both in terms of the number of visitors, but more importantly, perhaps, in terms of the outstanding scholarship produced in their catalogues. These projects, um, we need to start, of course, with contested visions uh, that you have on, on top, uh, organized by Ilona Katsu in 2011 for LACMA and then uh, traveled to Mexico City. They were uh, very similar to what uh, Convergent Cultures did in, in the late 90s, uh, with an emphasis on identity formation, explaining to US audiences that there were two sides of the history of the conquest of the Americas, and that indigenous peoples exercised their agency in, in a myriad of ways. A couple of years later, behind closed doors, focus, uh, focused on the richness of the decorative arts, taking th that big picture of the political and social turmoil into the calmness of the domestic space. Interestingly, it was organized not by an art historian who specialized in Latin America, but by Richard Aist, then curator of European art at the Brooklyn Museum. The show traveled to the Ringling Museum in Art in Sarasota in Florida and then to the New Orleans Museum of Art. Made in the Americas, the New World uh, Discovers Asia, you may have seen it uh, because it was organized uh, here at the MFA Boston by Dennis Carr, the then curator of American and Decorative Arts and Sculpture, brought attention to the profound influence of Asia in the arts of the colonial Americas, thus highlighting early globalization and trade. Far more recently, painted in Mexico, co-curated by a group of four extraordinary art historians, Luis Elena Alcalá, Jaime Cuadrello, Ilona Katsu, and Paula Mus. This was the first exhibition, I dare to say, that discussed the aesthetic features and artistic traditions of colonial Mexico, thus treating this art as art, with capital A and in the most Western and systematic understanding of what the history of art is considered as a discipline. And by that I mean with an emphasis on artist biography, technique, dates, a lot of, of, of information. All the pieces in the show were of incredible aesthetic quality, many of which were restored for the occasion. Interestingly though, the primary focus of attention was not a style, as I know firsthand that the curators hate, or at least distrust, the widespread usage of the term Baroque to qualify those objects. Thanks to its ambitious scope, the show traveled to the Met, where it ended a tour that had started at LACMA and continued to Mexico City. So these four exhibitions, what we, we can identify um, a development of the field from identity formation, decorative arts, globalization, and artistic tradition. So th those four big, big um, topics. 
The Met had received a, mu a few months before another exhibition on colonial Mexican painting, specifically focused on Cristobal de Villalpando. The curatorial team uh, was uh, formed by Rhonda Castle, the curator of Latin American art there, Jonathan Brown, the, a professor at the Institute of Fine Arts at the University of, of New York, and Clara Bargellini from uh, La UNAM. The selection of pieces was, again, outstanding, although I recognize I completely biased towards Mexican painting from the 17th century, that it's, in my perspective, far more mesmerizing and full of invention than that of the 18th century that uh, painted in Mexico studied. Unfortunately, uh, despite the large dimensions of one of the chosen paintings, or perhaps because of that, it felt very awkward uh, to have it placed in two galleries and on the foyer of the Robert Lehman wing. If you remember that setting, it's impossible for those objects to have uh, a conversation with 15th century Sienese paintings or European glass that were on display in the nearby galleries. I wonder if something similar is the case of the current exhibition taking place on that same wing entitled Juan de Pareja, Afro-Hispanic painter, that focuses on the work of a subject of the Met's iconic portrait by Diego Velázquez, who was enslaved in his studio for over two decades before becoming himself an artist. Do the inclusion of these painters of color from the past actually make the Met a more diverse institution? Just going to ask that question. Aesthetic quality was also a most relevant criterion followed by Jonathan Brown and by Guillaume Kienz, then curator of Spanish painting at the Louvre and now director of the Hispanic Society, when organizing Le Mexique au Louvre. An equally small exhibition where 11 Mexican masterworks were put on display for the first time um, alongside the museum permanent Spanish uh, collection. Although it was said that they were going to start acquiring uh, uh, paintings more, more often, to this day, this is the only painting that uh, is part of the Louvre um, collection. As director of the Hispanic Society, Kintz also was, uh, has been responsible for the traveling exhibition um, that such institution has organized on both sides of the Atlantic, as you can see in this very long list of venues, which makes sense because you know, they needed to travel the exhibition while their um, building was being refurbished. I find it surprising that the name of the show uh, in most of the venues was Tesoros, because some of you may remember that that was the name in 2006 of that exhibition organized by the Philadelphia Museum of Art that went also to LACMA and also to Mexico, uh, organized by Susan Stratton and Joseph Richel, the curator of European paintings at the Philadelphia Art Museum. Um, and that was a question by many because it implicitly evoked the European gaze that dazzled by these unusual artifacts, decided to place them in what felt more a cabinet of curiosities. Even if it was aimed to bring attention to the quality of the pieces. And this project was huge, no? um, over 250 pieces from around 13 countries, and still it felt a little bit exotifying. Beyond that term, I was hoping you also could notice uh, and something in that I mark in red, um, and it's related to how the MFA Houston and the Royal Academy decided to slightly modify the title, emphasizing Spain as the head of the Hispanic world. Remember my concern with visibility? What happens when a visitor goes and sees that painting? <coughs> Let me see if I can. Point, this painting here, attributed to Luis Juarez uh, in a show that starts with Goya's magnificent portrait of the Duchess of Alba. Are Alonso Vázquez and uh, Sebastián López de Arteaga, okay, the authors of these two paintings, both painters born in southern Spain, the best strategy to introduce viewers to stories of immigration of peoples, of models and techniques? Does this narrative effectively lead to an appreciation of local artistic features? I ask because a month ago or so, I delivered a lecture at the Cortal Institute of, of Art, my other alma mater, and one of the attendants shared she was shocked by the ways the Spanish-American materials were displayed. Even though those materials were, were on those galleries that I'm marking yellow, um, 
in three models called people and place, decorative arts and religious art, she shared that it was very uncomfortable with the secondary role these objects were presented, as if tangential or not relevant. Peripheral, she said. A similar critique could have been made of another exhibition entitled Art and Empire, the Golden Age of, uh, Age of Spain, organized in 2019 by San Diego Museums of Art, Michael Brown. And in that context, it is impossible for me not to be particularly engaged with this uh, comment now of this student, because as some as you may know, for the last few years, I have been claiming that the term art of the Spanish Americas is our best option, opposed to that of Spanish colonial art uh, that our field has been more commonly known in the United States. Because I argue, you know, it's more neutral, it defines more accurate, accurately, accurately uh, specific, uh, and, uh, and a specific geography in a specific moment of, of history. But now, just as when I get an, uh, an email, um, now just as much as when I get an email from someone say, uh, asking me if I can determine if a painting is from Murillo or not because they don't understand what the Spanish Americas are and they think that I know everything about the Spanish art, or when I think in my son's friends who are born in, were born in Madrid but live in Austin and therefore they are the real Spanish hyphen American, I have my doubts. I have been increasingly aware of the predicament we have when using this term Spanish Americas after watching a so-called documentary entitled España, La Primera Globalización, directed in 2021 by Jose Luis López Linares. Although the goal, they say, is repudiate the black legend by highlighting Spain's contribution to a world history, the whole piece really feels just a, that longs for the lost greatness. The lost greatness of the empire dangerously masqueraded as a song of inclusion. The history of the Spanish empire, the movie website claims, is unknown to most Spanish people. It's good to know it's worthwhile. There is no other history that can, can compare. Mexican and Argentinian historians like Martin Rio Sol, uh, Saloma and Marcelo Gullo appear on camera on interviews as if they were giving testimony of actual uh, uh, events or providing accurate records that you would expect in a documentary. Uh, and, but, the, but, but the movie, it's, it's full of contradictions, wonderful and dangerous contradictions. Um, on the one hand, Carmen Iglesias, the current uh, president of the Real Academia Española de la Lengua, talks about the importance of accepting a conquest if it's made, and I quote, with the goal of extending civilization. She also complains that Mexico's demand for a public apology for such conquest is ridiculous because what does the 16th century have to do with the 21st century? We must situate ourselves in the proper context, understanding that the countries and the peoples are not the same. And in plain contradiction, historian Elvira Roca appears saying that an empire past is a shared past that should be memorialized by all people across the Americas, very much across the same lines of her po polemical 2016 book called Imperophobia and Leyenda Negra, something like against the empire and the black legend. I have argued that at least in Mexico, indigenous peoples were able to maintain their languages and were recognized ownership of their lands until the Republicas Criollas of the 19th century decided otherwise. And that it was then when they were really forced to assimilate. And that as a mestizo woman, I think it is absurd to complain about the fall of the great Mexico Tenochtitlan. But from there, to accept that the colonization was the best that could ever happen to the regional population of the Americas, there is a long way. Following Edgardo Landen, I can say that what I think is importantly missing in the movie is a full awareness of how the Americas actually made Spain and the whole modern West for that extent. I keep thinking about the advantages of the term Iberoamerica <laughs> used in Tornaviaje, a, a fantastic um, exhibition organized by Rafael López Guzmán, Jaime Cuadrello and Pablo Amador for Museo del Prado in 2022. 
is Ibero-American equally as accurate and less dangerous to be appropriated by those with a political agenda? Matthew Restel, on that same webinar uh, organized by the Blanton, made a case of how relevant is to um, this exercise of thinking and rethinking our terminology. So I'm here with you thinking again what is the best way of, of labeling uh, our, our field. But now take a look because we're museum people, we want to talk about museum people and I think it's relevant to see the dramatism of the lighting, no, that we were just saying a minute ago, the way the Christ is on, on, the, um, on the wall, because I think the unique artifice created in the art museum really encourages ap appreciation. And that's something that we as curators and people that is interested in the display of this object need to be very, very uh, aware of. El Prado was also the site of a massive international exhibition in 2010. And I took these uh, images from uh, online, that's why the quality is very bad, and I apologize for that, um, that were, was organized, uh, sorry, with a lot of uh, governmental support to mark the bicentenary of the in independence uh, movements in Latin America. It was called the Pintura de los Reinos, and again, there was an emphasis on the Hispanic world. Um, but with that in mind, let's go back to the United States to investigate how the art of the Spanish Americas, or Ibero-American art, should we say, <laughs> is being presented to wider audiences nowadays in permanent collections instead of uh, temporary exhibitions. The picture you are seeing uh, now, it's a recent installation of the Snyde Museum at Notre Dame University where the few colonial paintings, uh, Latin American paintings in their collection are complemented with some objects from the almighty Toma collection, uh, integrated into the European galleries to offer what Edward Sullivan calls a double perspective that expands the Western canon. Expanding on those, uh, those connections with Europe, uh, a popular strategy to bring visibility to the art of the Spanish Americas is currently being used in the Phoenix Art Muse uh, Ar Museum of Art, where a gallery, uh, according no, the, uh, a gallery that was used to be 100% European art, now welcomes the visitors, labeled as Art of the Americas plus Europe, bringing together a medieval painting next to an 18th century one from the so-called Cusco School of Painting. Similarly, at the Blanton, we decided to also merge art of the Spanish Americas with that of, the, of Europe. However, I refuse with every cell in my body to such pairing, apparently valid due to common use, use of gold applied on the canvas and the lack of perspective, arguing to my dear colleague Holly Borham, curator of prints, um, drawings, and European art, that it was a distressing affirmation of the old Eurocentric reasoning that colonial painting in its gold and apparent flatness was antiquated, primitive, anachronistic. Instead, since the goal was to promote visibility and appreciation of art, we decided to pivot, as you can see in the wall panel, around Marian iconography, emphasizing mainly uh, geographic differences. For a moment, we consider narrowing the comparison uh, to only include 18th century paintings, uh, but then she needed to, to include the medieval paintings somewhere, so we decided to have them. Um, and so we uh, decided to, to have them together, but um, in, a, in a different way, emphasizing the artifice of architecture. And it's interesting because this painting came to us as a Peruvian painting. But the moment I started doing research and identified this uh, as Our Lady of Do or Nuestra Señora del Rocío, Patrona of Huelva, and then I realized that there is no documentation that, uh, of the cult in, in Peru, and there was no documentation of uh, this painting being ever in Peru, I kind of uh, had to assume that it was the market who decided that this painting, because of its quality, looked like a Peruvian painting. But it was not. So 
And the reason why I agreed also for that uh, uh, comparison then, it was because it's an, a Spanish painting, you know, that is uh, as regional as you could argue, you know, the, the school of Cusco or uh, any in, in South America, but it's, um, you know, the, um, the, the market, um, an unknown painting from South America these days is far more valuable than one from Southern Spain. Um, Working with Holly um, was very interesting for a, what for many could be a trivial aspect of a curatorial work, um, and that was label writing, um, because it reveals systemic differences in the way our two areas conceive artistic practice and develop methodologies for its study. In European art, the first line always identifies the artist, a privilege that we colonialists not always have. Because she had many identified authors, the place of production of the paintings themselves was a given, and in many cases was taken as secondary information. For me, the location of the object is hugely important and is determined by the objects themselves, based on a style and historical documentation, as I mentioned in, the, in, in this case. Um, we decided to use at the end the format, which in, uh, format of, of privileging the object, which interestingly forced us to think about how much European artists travel and revealed that learning, uh, no, learning about their tradition and the commercialization of their craft. We also decided to focus on copper plates as objects that travel that were used at boats at, at, at the Atlantic and go beyond uh, iconography. However fascinating and politically correct this dialogue uh, with European art is, a Spanish colonial painting has been also recently shown in tandem with American colonial painting, assuming that those painters of English ancestry had many similitudes with those of Spanish descent. We're seeing here two examples of such displays at the Met and at the Art Institute of, of Chicago. And I think it makes sense because they share some notions of taste and quality. This is another um, gallery view of the MFA Boston doing the same thing. However valid these comparisons are, I think in what Matthew Restall said again in that webinar that I mentioned before, regarding how precautious one needs to be when comparing the two colonial systems as they were only barely alike. He mentioned, for instance, how the phrase settler colonialism, constantly used in the history of colonial US, do not, do not apply to colonial Latin America, where settlers did not displace indigenous peoples in the same way they did here. Although Spanish conquistadors were indeed granted land, so did indigenous elites. I would add that the politics of extermination were radically different, with Latin America populations benefiting from a shared urban space that forced cultural amalgamation. Do you remember my preference for not using the term Spanish colonial art? It's rooted in here, because in the States, people assume the colonial is their colonial. Another way of expanding uh, this understanding of, of continental realities instead, I think that is far more uh, successful, is tying um, or emphasizing the, the, the connections with the Caribbean, as the exhibition that we now celebrate today. The arches, by the way, are just an amazing detail and really makes the, uh, the, the, each one of the paintings shine and, and be like in an enshrined in, in, in its own right. So congratulations for, for that. Because establishing connections with the present or with uh, more recognizable environments have been the, the, the root of all this place, I also want to consider other strategies receiving um, attention uh, uh, by the Spanish Americas. No, and we're seeing um, now uh, a, dis a display from a recent exhibition at, at Revision at the Denver Art Museum where the connection was with uh, contemporary uh, Latin American art, which I think is very interesting and is what I did in Mapping Memory when I 
um, ask um, my friend Mariana Castillo de Val to produce um, these uh, new maps no, in, in reaction to the amazingly beautiful map of San Pedro Tosocualco. And bringing those, those uh, things together or uh, inviting artists like Danielson Baniwa to react to uh, not flattery depictions of people of the Amazon like himself um, made in the, in the 17th century, um, 16th century, sorry, um, has been very, very interesting. And it, it's a way in which uh, curators are trying to not only question the canon, but also uh, making it relevant uh, for the future. To, to the present, sorry, and the future, of course. Um, the other obvious uh, connection is with Latine art, no? and notice that I use the E, as I love the encompassing sound of the second vowel instead of the dominant fourth. But so, okay, I'm telling what uh, I like, what I don't like about other shows, so I wanted to take you uh, to a very uh, brief, um, tour of painted cloth um, that was uh, that aimed to 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 make uh, recognize the beauty in in this object despite the context in which they were produced and something that was very important for me was to um, have cloth real cloth in the beginning of the, of the exhibition with the curtains, and you will see why uh, we're so, so important. Um, so the first section of the, uh, the, the exhibition started with this painting, which I think it is um, fascinating, not only because of the presence of the painted garments, but also because it opens conversations about how um, we don't have clear answers of how the colonial period actually was experienced by indigenous peoples because this man over here is being baptized, but he's on his knees, so he's being subjugated, and both things can happen at the same time. One willingly can accept something that is being imposed on us, and this is one of those uh, caciques, the real caciques, uh, that um, benefited from, from you know, uh, or kept their, their um, many um, privileges, uh, even during the, the colonial period. But so the, the idea of starting with this painting was really to open co up conversations. Uh, Painted Cloth was the, the exhibition w that received the largest or has received the largest number of students in, in, the, um, in the museum. Um, I was telling you know that I, 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 I dared to knock at as many doors as I could saying, even if you don't think there's something for your students, there is something that you can do with these artifacts and so come. So people from religious studies, from fashion studies, from anthropology, from uh, Spanish, from all different areas in the university, one of the beauties, as you know, you know of working in a university art museum is that we are at the core of, of uh, the creation of knowledge, you know? and, and all these questions are always welcome. Um, and so, but it was also, it is, it is so unique in its aesthetic that for me it was important to say, okay, what is different? What is what you are expecting? What is what these things should do? No, what is that you don't recognize? The second section was about uh, women's at work, you know, because if it's a, an exhibition, it was an exhibition about um, textile, of course, women have been always uh, at the core of, of that, no? Um, but then the exhibition, and uh, this is something that I argue, the, the exhibition display, it's in itself a way of creating knowledge. It's not only um, a result of the scholarly work. And the reason why I'm saying this is because if you see what I tried to do with this piece of, the, of Sama, and Franz Mayer was something that the, my deputy director said is like, it's at the, the construction of the image. Because the last, um, the last part, no? 
on this series of having uh, um, just the, the frame, then the garments would be the representation of this, of this painting and with the curtains that we had on the, on the entrance of the show. And so it was a way of creating a dramatic setting, but making people learn how to look at these objects and appreciate them in, in, in many ways, and not only because you should, because you, this is the, you know, the, the, the production of colonial Latin America, poor Latin America, you no. Know, um, and, and, and so the other thing, and the reason why I'm saying that there is knowledge that is being produced in, in the galleries is because we all are fascinated by the brocateado technique, right? It's one of the characteristics of the, of the Cusco um, uh, school of painting. But what happens when we see that in dialogue directly in the galleries with a estofado a sculpture. Then for me it became really evident that there were a lot of connections that I have not been able to see or appreciate before because then I realized that maybe this is not a depiction of a, of a statue, no? but it's a depiction of a, a sculpted statue. Maybe it's, it's not clear. Uh, but I think it, it was important to, 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 to see how different media um, relate to, to each other and how you know, it made sense for the people looking at these objects in their uh, specific context uh, could have been uh, appreciated. Other thing that for me was important was a stress visual literacy. And so I always say, if you, if you don't like this painting over here because the body is weird, because this is, no, it's okay. But you need to be aware of what you're expecting to see. What, what is your, your uh, understanding of what a human body should look like, a, a lion, no? And then um, understand that what they were trying to portray with a lot of realism was the, the garments, no? And that's why you have it here. The other thing that, that was incredibly important for me was to um, talk about the difference of um, the nudity, no? Because in one painting here, this, new, the, 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 this naked man is the, imperson the, the personification of virtue, Saint Jerome, but here the nudity is a symbol of uh, being wild, being not civilized, civil, civilized. And it's interesting because, you know, doing research also for the, for the um, um, exhibition, I realized that this idea of, of uh, naked people with uh, feathers of, uh, of um, skirts was established in the European imagination even before the term, the, the name America was established in the map of Martin Walzemuller. So I think it's interesting, you know, Tom Cummins has a, a, an article where he uh, talks about the idea of um, you know, uh, how um, the man eaters, you know, uh, as, as a symbol of, of uh, non-civilized was always accompanied by images of naked people. And so I think it, is, it was interesting to have these conversations based on, on this uh, and think about how we continue to, to expect certain things you now because we have been for centuries uh, um, educated in this idea of what is the, you know, what America is in the Western imagination. The other thing that for me was crucial was to create this place that um, were similar to the way these objects were used to be seen. And this is one of the corners of the show that I'm particularly uh, proud of, because what you are seeing is uh, an unfolding of, the Im of this image you know, that is taking place in the gallery space. This is the, the object that you see behind. It's a painted altar that is a painted altar mimicking uh, um, an, um, uh, a, 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 a fabric one. And a lot of people did not know that this was painted. A lot of people were tricked still to this day. 
And if you see you know, this painting as a painting, you may be losing you know, a lot of the ritual components that uh, were crucial for its appreciation. The other thing that for me was important was you know, when I selected this piece, this chasuble, um, was this. It's a, it's a, it's, that shows that the piece was used. No, because that's another idea. Museums, we want always, and we have conservators here that can uh, talk about that. No, we want objects to look almost as when they were made. And I think it was important to talk about, no, no, these objects, these garments were used and were damaged. No? The other thing that for me was important, and maybe that's why I love so much the arches that you have now in this exhibition, is that we made like a little chapel for this painting, which was the, the origin of the whole show. But it was important to think in a religious uh, space, not really, but no, um, art has um, taken the space of sacred artifacts in a, in a lot of ways. So having a, a, a creating a pause in the visit, in the, it was very important for me. And of course, admired the, the painting in, in all its um, grandiosity. Uh, we also had this idea of uh, pairing real garments with um, depictions of of garments, not only uh, European, no, but also indigenous. And we have the topu, which is depicted here. And this is the, the dress that this woman is, is wearing. And so it was uh, possible to, to connect um, with different um, aspects of, of the important um, culture of, of dressing. The other conversation that for me was very meaningful was to show that casta paintings, that the almighty you know, casta paintings that everybody talks about, that they continue to be very pos puzzling, um, they are about race just as much they are about class. And, and that is something that is very evident, sorry, in, in this uh, contraposition. Again, you know, creating this dialogue between objects, because these two are Spanish men but they are not the same, no? And I think it is, it is important to, to be aware of those uh, nuances. Um, the other thing that we did uh, um, was, because I was interested in, in creating this visual literacy, was to create these connections. No, we, we I always, uh, we hate that column, and finally we were able to use it for something and create this dialogue, no? As you can see, these two women are wearing very similar dresses and to have this conversation between a tiny object and the painting behind that, it was, it was fantastic. The other problem uh, is that our marketing team was delighted with, this, with these objects. As you can see, they're very creative. But I was not comfortable with how they were treating this painting because this uh, woman, you know, the, the Condesa of Monteblanco, was a slaveholder. And so I had the ethical problem of how much do I want to promote this image? Although she was a woman, so it's not that she was, you know, all power, uh, full, and it was very challenged. No, the, the, her role as a woman in the, in, in the nobility was, was challenging itself. But, you know, so I decided, okay, we had great ideas. I love the Met Gala, eat your hair out, but we cannot use it as much as we want. No, and also it was one of our uh, own pieces, uh, but I decided not to. Um, the other thing, and I love uh, that Horace decided to, to do something similar here, is that we included um, a small uh, section full of questions and very important questions. And I wrote to, sorry, like five, seven colleagues of mine, uh, asking them if these were the questions that were important to tackle, if it was the right tone, if it was, um, you know, because I, I, I needed to, to explain more things that it was not possible to explain in the gallery space. And also because I'm convinced that Museums can be the, the, the starting point instead of just the end. You no, know? you can go have fun, learn, enjoy, but later 
your brain continues to work. And those questions were there to incite those conversations. And I'm really happy because uh, students from the School of Education have been calling me saying, why did you decide on those questions? What are you know, the answers? And I spent a lot of time, uh, and I'm happy that, you know, that, that, that shows that, that they are uh, being receptive to, to that. You know? um, and we end up having, uh, you know, we want museums to be Instagrammable, if that's a word. Uh, so we decided to have our own selfie station where people can draw, feel the textures of, of, the, of the garments and be silly, you know? Because I think we're very afraid of being silly because we are museums. We need to, um, you know, be serious and, and, and um, impart lessons of what to do. But being silly is part of that, uh, you know, there's a lot of, of, of uh, written uh, theory on museums about how if you are a museum goer, you are creating memories. And we all thrive to create an exhibition that five, 10, 20 years ago, people still remember. And I'm going to be very happy one day, five, I don't know, a couple of years later, one of these people remember what they saw in painted cloth just because they were able to be silly, you know, taking a, a selfie. The, the idea of, of having um, pairings with um, paintings and, and real garments, historic garments, of course, is not new. No, uh, I'm showing you do, just two, two examples. Uh, the Phoenix Art Museum also have these ones that they decided even not to, to use historic garments. And, and as you can see here, they're just making the, the reference to, you know, this is a very angelical um, garment and therefore it's, it, it's, it's, it's enough to have a conversation with a Spanish uh, colonial uh, angel. But I think it's interesting. What I think we're doing is we're trying to incentivize people to come and look at this art without always focusing on the religious aspect, no? which is something that we um, have to tackle and it's difficult in a place that is not Catholic. No? This is, um, you know, this dramatism, uh, this idea of the, of the altar that I just show you, uh, of course, is not only um, something that, that we did. Uh, this is a, um, a display at Museo de Arte de Lima, no? that you have, uh, well, they have this fantastic piece. Uh, in silver, the front, altar frontal, and in Denver, for instance, I love this this uh, other way of creating um, a similar um, chapel. You no, know, that I think are uh, again doing. Uh, it's it's an effort to to make it more accessible. Um, and I think what we are trying in, in all these efforts is to create narratives and experiences that uh, allow for artifice and invention to be recognized. And if not, I'm happy to go at least with strange and beautiful as the adjectives for the art of this period as mean they are finally being noticed and celebrated in their own right. This is um, a uh, review of the installation of the Toma collection at the Nelson Atkins, no? Um, and I'm, I'm happy with being strange and beautiful. Uh, but hopefully, um, more than only that, and, and I think the, 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 the challenge would be to be understood in, you know, with all the socio-historical contradictions, but um, Maybe we now need to think, how will we create displays that think uh, colonial Latin America from within, no? and not always uh, in conversation with European art? Thank you so much. It was really a pleasure to be here with you tonight. Thank you, Rosario. Any questions? Hi.
Hi, Rosario. I was curious, um, the label that you, the wall label that you showed us in green about Marian images, um, the English label uses the Spanish Americas, but the Spanish label uses America Virenal. And I was wondering why that was chosen and why maybe vice regal is a more comfortable term in Spanish. Because I think nobody knows what vice regal means in English. It's a very, it's a very uh, difficult word. And uh, you know, here Horace and you know, the, 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 the Harvard Art Museum decided to explain what that is. And I, I think it's easier if you have a Spanish background, you understand it easier. So sometimes, for instance, I, uh, and, and I, I used to use Hispano America. Is Hispano America, no, Hispano America. But because of all that I know, conversation that I shared with you about how that is being used by the right in Spain, mm -hmm. uh, I'm more cautious now. Because that's the, the you know, el, el término Hispano America is the, the one that is more historic, you no? Know? Um, el, el Museo. Um, uh, ay, en Buenos Aires de Artes Decorativas. Fernández Blanco. El Fernández Blanco es el que usa, entonces era, ese era como mi, mi norte, ¿no? Es eh, decir, es el que ellos están usando en Argentina, es el que vale la pena usar, pero uh, with these conversations, you know, uh, in this larger context, I'm trying to use a different word, yeah. and, and that's why I use vice regal in, in Spanish, but not in English. Do you find it sort of less culturally loaded than colonial? It is, um, but also, you know, in Mexico there has been a, a long conversation, and I think it's related with that exhibition on Pintura de los Reinos, no? If New Spain was a kingdom, it was a vice royalty, it was a colony, and I think at different stages in history, it was one of the three, or the three at the same time, and so, um, I think it's less loaded, but maybe because we don't understand it as well <laughs> as we should. And so, yeah. And, and you know, that gallery for me was kind of, a, of an experiment, you know? Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for a very, very interesting presentation. Dr. Granados, a presentation that uh, left a lot of us with more questions, which is <laughs> nice, like how can this be solved? And, and also with hope as well, that have finally seen these questions being presented, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, this might be one of those. Uh, you, I, I, I missed the name of the person who was presented as uh, saying like, um, it can eat your heart out. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a white uh, enslaver. Mm -hmm. uh, at some point you said like, they have like, uh, like contradicting feelings mm -hmm. about using this image. Because basically she was she profited out of slavery, mm -hmm. mm, but my question in that sense, like, oh, who of those uh, white patrons didn't uh, have a relationship with slavery at the end of the day, or no, or didn't profit out of encomiendas, you know? And last night we like had this interesting uh, talk by Cecil Fromon, mm -hmm. and it was the same thing. Like, wh what? How can we deal with these topics? Like, should we like show them or hide them, or how them, we right show yeah. them? Yeah. So it's more or less like your thoughts at all. I, I think it's very interesting. Is uh, maybe we can assume of so many of them. I saw the documents of Condesa de Monteblanco. So maybe, you know, the, the portraits that we have upstairs, I have not seen the documents that say that these two, uh, you know, the Los Condes, uh, the Vega del Ren, you no, know, were um, slaveholders. Most likely don't because they didn't own land and their richness came from trade and for other, um, sources, basically, but Los Monteblanco own land, and I saw the documents, I, you know, and it has not been published, uh, and I'm still deciding what I'm going to do with that, because there was a lot of, and that's how I know that she was challenged, you know, as, as a heir of the, heir, heir of the, of the county, you know, um, but th that's what I, um, I think the difference make that 
my own personal experience with the documentation. You know, it's not that someone told me that she was a slave owner. You know, I I saw it in the documents in the archive in Lima, and and that makes a whole different. You know, and and when the the the, the marketing team show me the images, like I did, was not really aware of it. It was just like really literally like we were about to 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 open the exhibition. And I had um, I have written even uh, a label about it. And I in the portrait of her father, there are two slav slave um, uh, on the back of, of the portrait. And I had a, a detail of the portrait, you know, bringing them to, to the foreground. But I said, ah, I can talk about this if I'm there, or there is a, um, um, a docent talking about this. But if I leave the images, of those slaves living on their own without mediation, I don't know. I, I know it became an, an issue of control and, and my control, I'm kind of a control freak as all curators. And, and I said, I don't know how this is going to be received. And that's why I, I talked about it as I'm doing it with, with you now, but I didn't dare to just leave it there and have it uh, a, a life on its own, you know, which might be a little bit of, uh, maybe I was a bit coward, you no, know? but I would, wanted to do it in a more responsible, uh, meaningful way. And I think by presenting it to you, it's when I'm um, bringing that conversation to the foreground instead of just, you know, saying it there. With, with no accompaniment, or if that's our word, no, you know, like uh, being a, for these things you need like a doula, you know, <laughs> that holds your hand and, and help you make sense of these things. And I feel comfortable with other parts of the colonial um, reality, but, you know, and also because in America, the conversation about slaves is completely different. You no, know, uh, Matthew Restel on that webinar that I have cited like 10,000 times says that, that there is no clear understanding of how slavery worked in the Spanish Americas. And that was com slightly different from how it worked in the English speaking world. And those nuances I cannot um, explain in, in, in one label that is 150 words. No? So, Uh, thank you. You mind? <laughs> so thank you, Rosario. I mean, this was this was just uh, truly fantastic for uh, how much uh, you brought us here today to uh, uh, think about. I, I am a scholar of Spanish art, so I come from this from a very different uh, uh, and, and, and a very precise perspective. But very often, when I go to these exhibitions uh, that bring into the big museums uh, um, uh, colonial white regal art, I feel personally very uncomfortable. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think you, you brought in something today which is so interesting, which is the aesthetic, right? Uh, so the aesthetic is not something that is transcendental, right? It was invented uh, as a concept uh, in the late 18th century, which is exactly the ground on which museums were built. Uh, mm -hmm. So it is uh, not, uh, it doesn't come to a surprise that when the uh, when the, uh, uh, met the the Louvre uh, or the Prado or even the Metropolitan uh, bring in these objects into their collections, are actually they're inviting them to adapt uh, to a frame that is not being produced for them. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they do invite you to think of the aesthetic as something that will be, you know, uh, uh, be general enough uh, as a concept to 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 erase these. Uh, identity, political, geographical uh, borders, right? Uh, so, uh, which is not the case, right? Uh, so, I, I, I wonder to what extent uh, many of these uh, projects are coming into in, in, in the shape of exhibitions. We allow these big museums to be flexible en enough mm -hmm. uh, to open it up uh, to these new arguments without actually questioning who they are and where they come from. I mean, Absolutely. museums were just an invention of the recent, most recent past in, in Europe and then exported elsewhere, right? Uh, and. Uh, and, and these, for example, when I think of some of the exhibitions that you've been talking about, I think, for example, of that one in Torna Viaje. Torna Viaje is this beautiful word in Spain that means something like uh, 
come and return, right? So this, the Prado Museum uh, brings in this exhibition in which they show uh, many things, uh, paintings mostly being uh, collected in uh, little collections, mostly uh, religious collections, monasteries, uh, that had been brought from the Tally colonies. Of curiosities. Uh, yeah. yeah, exactly, right? And they uh, and uh, and they say, well, and they actually uh, uh, call them uh, kind of treasures, which I think mm -hmm. that I think the logic be behind that it is so dangerous, as you showed. Uh, so we offered them something. We did bring some treasures back, right? Uh, so there's like some sort of a reciprocity. Uh, I found that logic. Terribly colonial, uh, I have to say, because it doesn't even show anything about something also that you said, which is, I mean, this is not about what we what was brought, but how did, would that affect? I mean, is there any kind of uh, um, uh, circularity? There was nothing of that being shown. I mean, these things ended up in 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 different parts of Spain, but no one at the exhibition occur to work, to think about how these things then affected other artists in Spain, right? And, <laughs> and, and, and I think it's, sorry, let, I'll let you finish. Okay. No, so, uh, so but then the exhibition closes and these things return and the way that it is in Spain right now, Madrid, uh, the, 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 uh, the collections are divided between the Prado that holds from Titian to Velázquez, Rubens onwards, and then colonial art happens to be in the Museum of the Americas, <laughs> which is a tiny museum. In a, in, in, in and the, no one visits. In, which actually no one visits. So there's, a, again, a very dangerous logic behind this, which is actually is not the case of Spain. It is case of, you know, many places and some of them very close to us, uh, which is dividing what's artistic and what's of ethnographic interest. Uh, and we, you know, we keep on these things and we just uh, uh, continue with these things as we ignoring what's, what's, what, what's behind it. So I wonder, because the aesthetic, uh, it is a modern uh, ter uh, term concept and even terminology, but also because art is such an in a modern invention, uh, I think when, when we invite all these, uh, the, these colonial paintings to share the space with, uh, uh, with, with our Western early modern collections, uh, this uh, is a very unfair competition. Uh, so you're inviting someone from the Americas to play in the field of canvas painting, which is something that was invented and produced and very much developed by the Renaissance when it ended up in. So you might have someone amazing like Villalpando that is able to, to, to enter into this competition. Most others were not. So I always thought, wouldn't it be, I mean, wouldn't it be the, the right thing to do to have a big exhibition of, I know Tom, Tom Cummings is here, of Keros or maybe textiles mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. at the Prado. Mm -hmm. That would be fur. That would be the fur competition that we like to see. But not having, you know, uh, Peruvian uh, Cuzco paintings working side by side with Titian. I mean, that's, just, that's, that's absurd. But, you know, there's many things. I, 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 I agree. It's like you, we need to understand what was the aesthetic, you know, in their exactly. native culture. <laughs> That's part of the reasons why I made a show about textiles, no, to, to, to speak that language. But I also think that, you know, um, these paintings produced in, in Latin America, they are like me in a lot of sense. And I'm speaking, and you yourself, no, we're speaking English with a very strong accent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and still people understand us, mm -hmm. you know? And it's okay to have a strong accent. Some people work very hard to get rid of it, you know, but it's part of your identity, mm -hmm. you know? And I mean, I, I have friends from LA who, who really decided not to, 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 to make evident their, their uh, origin and they work very hard to get rid of their accent. Um, because they did not want to be seen as not English speakers, no? But I think something similar we, we can do with these paintings. If we want them to be Tiziano... Exactly. But who can be Tiziano? Only Tiziano. I mean, there are thousands of Spanish artists that are not Tiziano. Yeah. You know, our collection at the Blanton, it's uh, of European art, is full of... Um, ah, where, I forgot, uh, where Columbus was born? In Genoa. In Genoa. <laughs> Our collection is mainly Genoa, from, from, from Genoa. 
That's a secondary school of the great European art. But we can do a great story about Genoa and how the, you know, the banks uh, actually um, gave money to the Spanish uh, Empire and blah, blah, blah. We can problematize it from that perspective. And it's OK. They, they look some, you know, like ugly. And that's OK. If we all want, if art needs to be Velázquez, if art needs to be Tiziano, half of the things in El Prado itself, and that's why the, 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 the storage is it's full, yeah. even in El Prado. But, but I understand your point. It's like, what it, and there was a, a whole uh, conversation. What is the value of having this exhibition at El Prado and not al Museo de America? And everybody said it's because of visibility. You know, people are going to pay attention if it's in El Prado. If it's in El Museo de America, it's another boring Actually, exhibition. Please do not get me wrong. I'm not arguing for having the exhibition at the, at the Museo de America. I mean, to me, that would be, in a way, outrageous. Uh, I think the thing is that it is not only about having this episode of three months exhibition at the Prado. It has to be about the, the collections themselves. Uh, changing in a way that would accommodate these objects uh, in ways that, you know, this division between ethnography and art is questioned. This and, and also, like, I find, to be honest, no, that, that way of doing art history, very boring. Like, you know, I, the, 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 the language used to describe an Italian painting with, um, you know, the way people describe the brushstroke, you know, and all these embellishments of language. It's not the art history that I learned from that man over there to do, <laughs> right? I mean, we, we talked about uh, other things. And, and I think that, that's, that's the problem, to think that we, there's one way of doing art history and, and that there is one canon that, needs to, that we need to be, you know, we, the Latin American painter, need to be Tiziano. Like, and that's why, you know, that, that, that painting from Denver, it's ugly. Yes, say it. It's ugly. You feel strange with, but you like El Greco. Why you like El Greco and you think that guy is awkward? That's just a question, you know? And it's something that I have been, you know, I don't like the, 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 the word decolonization and all that because I think it's really a fashionable thing. And also, Tom Cummins, I remember in our seminars, we, we always talked about theory needs to be embedded in the, in the argument, but not at the for, foreground. No? Something that I have been using is we need to decolonize the gaze, not the objects themselves. And the problem is with you and your expectations, not with the paintings. And I think that's, that's the, the, the moment in where we are, right? It's like when, with Arte Popular, no? O sea, te dicen que Arte Popular, it's ugly. It's, it's not well done because the artists were not trained. Who told us that that's the only way of having a beautiful object? And Gabriela Siracusano did a, a fantastic show that I, I didn't see you know, in, in Buenos Aires, but I, I read the catalog and I talked extensively with her about the aesthetic of the ugly. And, and Umberto Eco has showed us you know, all those things. Why are we so afraid of something being ugly? And if it's ugly, then for, therefore it doesn't have value. And I think those are the, 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 the and, and, and I love that I, can, I could have that conversation between the, the, San, the, the, the pairing that I put no, with the San Lorenzo and the El San, San Jerome. Like, which one do you think is more beautiful? Why do you think this is beautiful? Because it has gold, no? But it's really flat. What is what you are expecting? And, and I think that's part of the re responsibility of a museum is visual literacy, is, is teaching people to say, what, what, are, what, is your, what are your expectations? Why this is not meeting your expectations? You know? And w how can you learn to look these things? And again, it, they have a strong accent. Still, are you willing to hear what they have to say? just as much as many of you are being willing to listen to me despite my strong accent, right? Because you are assuming I have something to say, 
which I'm really grateful for. But it's the same, it's the same thing with the paintings, no? It's, and, and that's where the colonial becomes a problem to me. And I don't have that problem in Spanish. Like I can say colonial todos los días de mi vida, no? Which is how I grew up, no? Talking about this as colonial. But in the States have another connotation. And I, I, and I think also that because I'm Mexican living here, I, I need to be able to, and because of what you said about me, no, I, I really believe that curators are bridges. And so I need to translate certain things to the public or the main audience that I'm going to have, which of course, I'm a micro museum in Texas, right? I guess if, if I were writing at the Met, it would be a completely different challenge, no? Uh, because then you don't have one a specific audience, but you have, you know, a myriad of nationalities visiting, and that's another different kind of uh, label writing. Um, you know, I love the, 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 the new labels at El Prado are just extraordinary. Because they, they, I think they have understood that diversity, you know, that they are a, a top tier, uh, museum that there need to do certain things and and that I think is that the value of shows like that one you know that still exotifies <laughs> but with a little bit more respect maybe yeah. it's, a beginning. it's a beginning yeah I think we need to real quick um, I love, thank you so much for your talk. I loved um, that like curatorial historiography, you know, of the field um, and kind of to piggyback on Felipe's comments, aspirationally, what would you like to see in the future of Spanish <laughs> art in the America, uh, exhibitions of Spanish art in the Americas? I think I want more immers uh, immersive installations, no? Um, and that's why I, I show you those two um, Parts. I think, um, you know, there's a, um, I forgot the name of the author, but, but he says that we, 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 the museum, it's such a, an artifice in itself, you no, know, that it takes a lot of the energy of these objects, you no, know, because we, we create, we force them, we force a, a narrative on, on them. And I guess for me it would be more, about uh, bringing that um, original context into, into the viewer's ex experience, no? Uh, I think it was one of the great successes of, of, of Painted Cloth. Uh, those two areas, no, with the altar, like the, the, the expressions of awe, literally, like, <gasps> no? One and after the other, that's what I want as a curator. You know, I want people to learn a lot, but I want that moment of, oh, this is amazing. You know, that, that, that thing that, that makes memorable installations, you know, that, that's what I, I aspire to, to do. And I don't know yet what, you know, what's going to be the next project, but I, 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 I'm, I know it has to do know with with that feeling of you know I we had a, a Magdalene uh, coming from the collection of the um, uh, I the Stern collection the um, I forgot the full name the Barbosa Stern sorry um, and a lot of people were just like they couldn't believe that that anonymous piece from the mid 18th century was just there, you no, know, doing its thing, and people saw thought it was very um, surrealistic. That you no, know, a lot of different connections, but because we had a painting just as much as you did in this installation with a lot of breathing room, which is something that I have not liked in many other displays. You no, know, that you have virgin, 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 <laughs> and there's a moment where you say, okay, I don't want to see one more. <laughs> No, I mean, I do, I, I know these things, but I need space. I need negative gallery space that allow me to breathe and to take in and to say, oh, that's what I want. 
that's, that's how I conceive curatorial practice. That's how I encourage uh, you know, people to, to enjoy. And, and maybe that's because I, I, I love going to museums. And I think that's the, the counterpart you know, of our job. You need to go and see a lot of <laughs> exhibitions in order to see you know, what do you want to do. Just as much as you need to read in order to write. No? Thank you so much. Thank you.